You are listening to Russia on the Record, a podcast from the Moscow Times. In this week's episode, we would like to tell you more about the pressures Russian journalists, activists, and public figures have gone through during the last few months, not only in Russia, but also abroad. But first, here are the top news stories from Russia this week. Pro-peace presidential hopeful Boris Nadezhdin has submitted 105,000 signatures endorsing his candidacy for the election in March to the Central Election Commission. His team claims to have collected more than double the 100,000 signatures required to run for office, excluding those counted outside Russia. The Central Election Commission will decide within 10 days of the January 31st deadline whether Nadezhdin can continue in the race. Nadezhdin told the Moscow Times that, if elected, he would sign a peace treaty with Ukraine. So far, the Central Election Commission has approved four candidates, including President Vladimir Putin, to run in the election. At the same time, four presidential hopefuls have withdrawn from the race, with some of them calling on their supporters to vote for Putin. Russia and Ukraine exchanged hundreds of prisoners of war on Wednesday, just a week after a Russian military plane allegedly carrying captive Ukrainians crashed near the border. Moscow said 195 of its soldiers were freed, while Kiev said 207 soldiers and civilians were returned to the country. There is still no independent verification of Moscow's claims that last week's plane crash killed dozens of Ukrainian prisoners of war who were en route to a prisoner swap. And on Thursday, Russian investigators said that they had confirmed that two missiles fired from an America-made Patriot anti-air system shot down the plane. Members of the Russian-Belarusian rock band B2, who were detained last week in Thailand, flew to Israel on Thursday amid fears that they could have been deported to Russia. The band, which was performing in the Southeast Asian country, was accused of failing to properly fill out paperwork needed to hold concerts. There were concerns the band members would have faced persecution if they were deported to Russia, since they had openly spoken out against Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. And a Russian woman is in court, after becoming the first person to be charged for displaying the rainbow flag since the Supreme Court designated the so-called international LGBT movement an extremist organisation. Ina Masina, a 33-year-old photographer from the Saratov region, allegedly posted a picture of the rainbow flag online a month before the ban went into effect. She faces 15 days in jail or a fine of 2,000 rubles, $22, if found guilty of displaying an extremist symbol, according to the rights group Pervi Atdel, which is representing her in court. They argue the case against her is unconstitutional as it violates Massina's right to freedom of speech. Human rights groups have warned that the vague wording of the Supreme Court's judgment last year puts LGBTQ plus people at risk of wide-reaching persecution. The fact that the Russian intelligence services have an omnipresent surveillance network inside the country is unsurprising. However, in recent months, scandals about the monitoring of Russians by these services abroad, as well as news of the detection of foreign spies, has become more frequent. We spoke with investigative journalist Andrei Soldatov about the work of Russian intelligence services outside Russia. What kinds of people do Russia's security services target abroad? Obviously, they're constrained in what they can do beyond Russia's borders since they have no authority in other countries. So how do the ways they target people outside of Russia differ from how they target people at home? Well, unfortunately, the picture is not that clear. Well, uh, yes, there are some limits for the Russian security services in a way they could conduct operations abroad. But what we see now, and uh, I would say that that started in January 2023, that uh, the Russian state is uh, paying more and more attention to Russian political immigration, specifically to people who are stay politically active. And we talk about activists and but mostly about journalists. Because these days we see that the conventional political activities in the country are probably just impossible. You cannot go to streets to protest. You cannot have any kind of conferences or protest rallies. The participation in political life is extremely restrained by, by the authorities. And uh, I think we've been living in this climate since uh, the beginning of uh, pandemic, uh, which was a great excuse to 
completely forbid all kinds of expression of opinion on Russian streets. And this is why online journalism, and we are talking mostly about online journalism, is the main tool to try to influence public opinion in the country. It's also a way to tell the rest of the world that in the country there are still people who are not absolutely happy with the war. And of course, the Kremlin is not happy. But people in the Kremlin understand that we need to do something about it. And that is why we see an increasing amount of pressure on political activists and journalists. Uh, and as I said, it's uh, this campaign is quite sophisticated because it's a combination of uh, several things. You have some attacks on Russian media in exile and Russian journalists in exile, which uh, take place in the country, and you have attacks on them in the countries they live now. Which countries do Russian security services operate in most actively? How do we know this, and why do they do it in these countries specifically? Well, we see that it's mostly, you might explain that by the way political activists and journalists will live in the country before the invasion and uh, right after it started. Because many things were, well, people left the country with no time to secure sometimes visas or get your new passports. So they mostly try to move to the country where you do not need a visa as a Russian citizen. So we are talking about Central Asia, we are talking about Armenia and Georgia, Montenegro and Serbia, of course. And also there were several countries in Europe which proved to be quite receptive to Belarusian and Russian activists and journalists. So this is, of course, three Baltic countries. Uh, to some extent, Germany. I would say that now uh, lots of people who initially settled in Central Asia and Georgia, and also Armenia, they're trying to move further west because it became extremely risky and I would say dangerous to stay in these countries. We already have a list of people being extradited from Central Asian states. We also have people who just disappeared, for instance, from Georgia. We have several instances, actually quite a lot of instances, when people who settled in Georgia, when they traveled abroad out of Georgia, they couldn't get back to Georgia because all of a sudden Georgian authorities decided that they do not want these people in their country. And it's extremely unpleasant and uh, unfortunate. And also we see that in terms of security risks in Europe, there's also some movement. I would say that now lots of people consider countries like Austria as not extremely safe. We already have, for instance, an example of uh, Christo Grozev, who is not a Russian journalist, but we know that uh, as a Bulgarian journalist and uh, digital investigator, he's been extremely active at exposing the operations of uh, the Russian security services. So he was forced to leave Austria because of security reasons. So I would say that now we see that constant movement of people around Europe because things change and they're changing every day. Over the summer, there were reports of independent Russian journalists abroad being poisoned. Has any new information come to light since these alleged poisonings were first reported? And do you think Russian authorities are trying to poison journalists for their critical reporting of the Kremlin? Well, given the history and track record of, uh, of the Russian security agencies, even before the war, I think it's uh, entirely possible. We have at least one proved case, proven case, when a political activist Natalia Arno was uh, poisoned of a million or in Prague. Uh, we have several other cases of Russian journalists being attacked. We just, the problem is that poison is such a good method for the security services because you always can pretend that nothing actually happened and blame the victim. That is why the Russian security services have loved this method for so many years. I remember that the very first really big and scandalous poisoning took place as old as in 2003 of Russian journalist Yuri Shikachihin. And uh, it's proved to be extremely effective because you don't just kill the victim. You send a very strong message to his or her friends and relatives, and you actually send a very 
strong message to everybody who wants to stay active politically. At the same time, you, you can always pretend that, no, 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 you, you did nothing. And it's all because of the victim, because the victim got drunk or uh, was on drugs or whatever. And you can always uh, can use this uh, thing about vulnerability. You just say, well, nothing actually happened. But people who need to understand the message, they understand. So you were talking about the message. What's the real purpose of these operations? To catch and imprison all these people who are potentially dangerous for the government, or just to intimidate them, to make them change their behaviour abroad? I think it's, um, it's more about trying to silence them. These days, as I said, the most important thing we can do from abroad is to keep doing our job as journalists, keep talking, keep exposing Kremlin's lies. And of course, as I said, the Kremlin is not really happy with this kind of activities. So they're using a combination of methods. And I think it's why it is so sophisticated, because it is about some legislation, for instance. So something purely legal from the point of view of the Russian state. And uh, also the methods used by the security services. When you take this in combination, it makes it a very, very effective tactics. And just to give you exam- an example, so we have lots of journalists, including myself, being on the same time on the list of foreign agents, which means that you cannot be properly cited in the Russian media, which still operate in the country, that your books are not longer available. And I have three books published in Russia and in Russian, but they are not available now because I was proclaimed a foreign agent last year. At the same time, we have journalists, the same journalists, being accused of spreading fake news, which means that we are on the wanted list of the Russian authorities. And uh, it means that you need to be extra careful when you plan uh, your travels abroad, because sometimes uh, some countries might still have really good relations with Russian authorities, and you need to double check that they actually can go to uh, a particular country. And um, also, you have some new things, like the legislation approved quite recently, which can actually provide the legal reasons for confiscation of uh, one's property, one's assets. I already have all my financial assets not confiscated, but blocked by the Russian authorities. But of course, it's a big problem for lots of people who still have some property, apartments, cars left in the country. So when you have this kind of pressure coming from the country, and at the same time, you need to think about your travels and uh, about your relatives and about your friends and the way you communicate with your sources and contacts in the country, it makes a lot of pressure. The Russian academic Vyacheslav Morozov was recently detained in Estonia and accused of spying for Moscow. What do you think of this case? Do we know of any instances of Russian security services recruiting Russian academics working abroad? And what impact could this case have on the lives of Russian academics abroad who still maintain connections with Russia? It is a very interesting case because we know so little about the case. Uh, we know only about the fact that he was arrested on high treason charges. The problem with the case is that we do not know any details about his um, supposed treasonous activities, which is quite unfortunate. At the same time, I cannot completely rule out a possibility that we can we can have some of course some agents, some penetration in Russian political immigration, which is absolutely I cannot say normal, but it's something we could expect. I cannot say that I know for sure that Morozov was one of them, but this is a thing that already a year ago our Belarusian colleagues told us to get ready to a huge penetration operation, because that's exactly what they experienced two, three years ago. Because that's how this logic of uh, the Russian and Belarusian security services work. They need to infiltrate the community of Russian activists and, uh, of course, journalists are extremely important because, not only because of the message, but because we know so many people, we travel, we, we see people, we talk to them, and we also talk to people who are still in the country, which makes, at least in theory, us extremely interesting for, uh, for Russian security services. We have at least one example of such a penetration, and uh, it was 
in case about a journalist. There is a journalist who has a dual citizenship of Spain and Russia, Pablo Gonzalez, and he was detained by Polish security services almost immediately after the invasion started. And I knew him and he sounded and looked like a proper journalist who covered lots of war zones and conflicts. Uh, but unfortunately, it looks like he was actually an agent of the military intelligence. And because he was present at many conferences and attended by Russian activists and Russian journalists, he had access to some very sensitive information about these people. And now he's still in detention, so there was no proper trial. But as far as I get from Polish security services, what we hear from them and from people who are in touch with them, the case is, uh, is quite serious. You mentioned about Belarusian secret services and how Russian media often compares the strategy of the Russian secret services and the repression system there to what's going on in Belarus. And they say that in a couple of years, the Belarusian picture will apply to Russia and Russian citizens. Is Russia emulating Belarus in its strategy of harassing and intimidating journalists and activists abroad? I would not say that this is an emulation because they are basically from the same school of the KGB. And as we try to explain in our book, The Compatriots, uh, which is about the relationship between the Russian political emigration and the KGB, the problem, the challenge of uh, dealing uh, with uh, Russian political emigration was a defining moment for the KGB. And it has such a huge legacy even now in all security services who believe them to be successors to the KGB. And of course, that means the FSB and SVR, but also uh, Belarusian KGB. Uh, that is why some of the methods and tactics and operations uh, conducted by the Belarusian KGB look so close to the operations conducted by the FSB. There is constant, I would say, exchange of uh, practices and methods between the security services of these two countries. The thing why we need to watch closely what is done by the KGB of Belarus is that because they, they try and think before the FSB and the FSB is watching closely, does it work or does it not? And that is why some of uh, the tactics are almost immediately picked up by the FSB. With some, they take more time to consider whether it is worth it. For instance, a year ago, lots of people outside of the country were quite concerned with uh, the Belarusian initiative to strip the Belarusian dissidents in exile of the Belarusian citizenship. And we believe that back then that this kind of tactics might be picked up by the FSB almost immediately because it looked quite logical. Why not to get back to Soviet practices? It's not done as of now. It might be done maybe in the future, but it's not applied by uh, and used by the FSB. And I think the reason is because the FSB are not really, they're not stupid. They are calculating their risks. They are calculating the benefits of actually of not depriving political dissidents and, and activists and journalists of a Russian citizenship. And uh, it looks like they believe that now it's it's actually still fine to leave us as, as we are, because I can see some reasons for that. Uh, we still, most of us, we still have our Russian passports. The reason is that we do not want to apply for political asylum because when you apply for political asylum, it means that you cannot work. And I think, and lots of my colleagues think, that now it is a moment that we need, we should work as journalists. It is our duty. We just cannot sit and wait for a year or maybe two for the decision of the country which welcomes us because it is the time we need to do our job. And that is why we live on our Russian passports. But if, say, the Russian state would say, no, now you are, you have no citizenship, it would make things maybe, in theory, well, slightly easier for the Russians, because maybe the European Union or some other countries would need to come up with some solution for people like us. As of now, we still consider to be Russian citizens, which means that if, for instance, I get my passport expired, I would need to go to the Russian consulate. And I cannot do that because, again, there is a new legislation introduced just at the end of the last year, which basically 
allows uh, Russian consulates to confiscate Russian foreign passports. And you can find yourself on the limbo. So you're still a Russian citizen, but you cannot get a new passport, which means that you cannot travel and your situation is getting more and more precarious. And the Russian security services seems to be quite happy to, uh, to, to have us in uh, this situation. That's all for this episode. We will continue keeping you up to date on news about Russia in future weeks. So stay tuned and thank you for listening to Russia on the Record.